Thomas Kent was one of the 16 men executed following the Easter Rising. Arrested after an RIC raid at the family home in Castle Lyons, County Cork, during which a policeman was killed, Kent was executed on the 9th of May 1916. He was buried in the grounds of Cork Prison. At the time, his family had requested that his remains be released to them for burial outside the prison. That request was refused. Now, 99 years later, the Kent family's wishes are being observed. This is the scene at St Nicholas's Church in Castle Lyons, County Cork, where the state funeral for Thomas Kent will begin shortly. The funeral ceremonies include requiem mass and full military honours as Thomas Kent's remains will be buried in the Kent family grave here in the grounds of St Nicholas's Church. Good afternoon and welcome to RT's coverage of the state funeral of Thomas Kent. I'm joined in studio by Gabriel Doherty of the Department of History at UCC and we'll be discussing with him uh, the life of Thomas Kent, uh, how he came to be executed and of course the series of events that led to today's state's state funeral. Now, within the last hour and a half, the remains of Thomas Kent were taken from the chapel at Cork's Collins Barracks to Cork Prison. It was in a yard at Cork Prison that Thomas Kent was executed and then buried in a lime pit. His remains were disinterred last June. Earlier, a guard of honour comprising prison officers lined the way into that yard for the arrival of the coffin. Members of Thomas Kent's extended family were joined by prison staff for a short prayer service before the removal to Castle Lyons and burial there this afternoon. As pre preparations continue in Cork for this afternoon's state funeral, let's get some more detail on the background to the event and find out more about Thomas Kent. Jenny O'Sullivan has compiled this report. While most of the events of the 1916 Rising occurred in Dublin, there were a number of incidents in other parts of the country. One of them involved a prominent Republican family in North Cork, the Kents of Castle Lyons. A fatal skirmish at the family farm led to the execution of Thomas Kent. So who was Thomas Kent and why was this farmer's son and his brothers from Castle Lines in North Cork considered so dangerous? They would have been uh, a prominent separatist family in North Cork, uh, but they would have traced their lineage back to uh, the land war of the you know, late 1880s. And so they were much older than a lot of the rebel leaders. They would have been in their middle age in the late 40s up to 50. Uh, and so that also differentiated them quite a bit. In the aftermath of the rising, an order was made to round up known activists around the country. And in the early hours of May 2nd, 1916, an RIC raiding party surrounded the Kent family home at Bernard, demanding that Thomas Kent, his three brothers and their elderly mother surrender. They refused and a gun battle ensued in which Head Constable William Rowe, a father of five, was shot dead. Our grandfather was sleeping on the eastern side of the house and Thomas Kent was sleeping on the western side and the shooting happened, you know, it seemed to be out of all windows but our grandfather makes reference to a statue that was here in the oratory and in the middle window here between the bedrooms, you know, that, that took from, from the attention of the gunfire and that he, he felt had saved them and had saved their lives. One of the Kent brothers, Richard, was mortally wounded trying to escape. His brother David seriously injured. Thomas and the youngest William were both arrested, taken to Cork where a court-martial found Thomas Kent guilty, not of murder, but of armed rebellion. And on May 9th, 1916, he was executed by firing squad. His execution is controversial because he was executed uh, for taking part in a, basically in a rebellion um, rather than for shooting dead uh, Head Constable Rowe. So uh, when we think about it, uh, we don't really know who fired the shot that killed uh, Con Head Constable Rowe. Thomas Kent had been identified by that stage as a leading organiser, a leading member of the volunteer movement, a combatant in the Galtee Battalion. The fact that William Rowe had been killed on the day that probably earmarked um, Thomas Kent for the, for the severe penalty. For years, the family campaigned unsuccessfully to bring their uncle's body home. Plans for a new prison gave this desire an unexpected boost. But unlike the exhumation in 2001 of the 10 Irish volunteers executed at Mountjoy Prison, there were no records. It was complicated because we were told, oh, you know, this place has been not quite rebuilt, but it has had different extensions built to it. And uh, who knows, but that maybe 
uh, the place where Thomas uh, Kent was uh, buried, perhaps a building is now over it. Armed with the findings of a geophysical survey, a specialist team led by archaeologist Tom Condit of the National Monument Service began digging. At a shallow depth, human remains were soon found, showing clear signs of an execution. There were no shoes, no coffin, and among the artefacts, a set of rosary beads and a bullet. When his remains were removed from the prison four days later, an impromptu guard of honour was formed by prison officers who had tended his grave over many years. That's my father and mother, mm -hmm. and Auntie Peru. There was a lot of stories yeah. bended about that he was, you know, in a different place and he'd been moved, so they were, they were relieved, I think, that he'd never been disturbed from the day that he was buried, really. Yeah. It was good to hear he that as well. He was buried where, yeah. he, where he was executed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When he was exhumed, like, the, the, the grave was quite shallow. In, he, he, um, he was buried in very rubble, like terrain, you know, it was very um, stony. Like stony. That. For the Ken family, the long years of waiting are almost over. Soon their uncle will lie alongside his brothers, home at last. You have to think, would he like to be, to be disturbed? Mm -hmm. You know, but I mean, he, father was always trying to, to get him to come down to his, mm -hmm. with his own family. And it would be nice to have him back. Father made so many attempts to have been brought to bring him home, and he could never get anywhere to get anyone to help him. So no to coming, and that's great. Jenny O'Sullivan reporting there. Now, um, dignitaries are beginning to arrive at the church uh, in Castle Lyons, the Taoiseach. And to Kenny arriving there, um, also in attendance today uh, at the state funeral service. Um, other party leaders, the Fianna Fáil leader Micheál Martin, the Tornishta, and of course um, President Michael D. Higgins. So a, uh, a very high level turnout, uh, Gabriel Doherty of UCC for this uh, funeral. Um, in Jenny O'Sullivan's report we saw uh, some of the detail of, of, uh, of exactly what happened and, and who Thomas Kent was and so on, because he really was, as many have said, the forgotten volunteer. Yes, he was. Uh, the, 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 I think there are two main reasons uh, why he was forgotten. First of all, he, he's very frequently, even to the present day, confused with Eamon Kant, uh, one of those who was executed in 1916. Uh, and secondly, of course, because the body lay for decades in Cork military barracks, which was then subsequently turned into, into Cork prison and therefore inaccessible, uh, the, the, his memory tended to, uh, to practically disappear, even in Cork. Even though there's a train station named after him, of then, but, but but it, it, it's surprising that there are a number of people who think that is named after Eamon Kant, sure, uh, rather than Thomas Kent. Talk a little bit about uh, Thomas Kent's background, because uh, I was quite surprised when when, when I was uh, reading up on him for for today that he's he's older than I had imagined. Yeah, yeah. he's I mean, from he, a different generation. He is, he is. I mean, he's he's the the generation I suppose that bridges between the famine. And 1916, he, he isn't alive during the famine, let's say in contrast to, to Donovan Rosser. Uh, but the family are absolutely steeped in the land war, the land campaigns of the, of the 1880s, both the, of the land league days of the early 1880s, but more particularly the plan of campaign in North Cork, which was, which was particularly intense in North Cork. You had the Mitchellstown massacre, uh, you had the death of John Mandeville. Uh, it, it is very intense on, on precisely the estate in which they are. Uh, they hold their tenancy. Uh, and as a consequence of that mobilisation, a number of the brothers serve terms in, in prison. They're also involved in boycotting. Uh, one particularly uh, famous case involved uh, questions in the House of Commons. Uh, but they subsequently become involved in practically every major organisation, particularly of a nationalist ilk, but not, not, not solely. They are very active, for example, in the temperance movement. Uh, but things like the Gaelic League, the GAA, the, the revival of interest in Irish music and, and Irish dance at that time. Um, also involved, and it should be noted, in the United Irish League of the 1890s, which was a constitutional movement. Uh, but the, I suppose their main point of interest from today's perspective uh, is their involvement, or particularly Tom's involvement, as a leading figure within the volunteers. They helped to establish the volunteer movement in North Cork in 1913, 1914. 
uh, Tom and his brothers side with the minority the, the, who are associated with people like Tomás McCurtain and Terence McSweeney after the split in the autumn following John Redmond's call to enlist in the British Army. And he maintains a high profile throughout 1914, 1915, on into 1916, particularly uh, active in campaigns against recruitment. OK, and I think we can see there live pictures of the cortege arriving at... Um, at Castle Lions, and we can see the uh, the escort of honour there, um, lining uh, troops lining the route, members of the defence forces, uh, of course, honouring a commandant in the Irish Volunteers, Gabriel. Well, I mean, one of their founding fathers. I mean, there, they, there would be tremendous respect, particularly within the the Southern Brigade, uh, who regard themselves as the inheritors of, of the famous uh, brigades in Cork who fought during the War of Independence, and Thomas Kent would be regarded. Uh, as, as a heroic figure, uh, particularly within the, the, the Cork troops. Yeah, and uh, interesting to see the numbers that are there, uh, Gabriel. Given what you, you've, you've, we've discussed about his, his, uh, his being forgotten. It, it, um, it, it, it's no surprise, uh, it really isn't. I mean, especially in Cork over the last, since the word came through that the, uh, the body was being exhumed, and particularly since the announcement was made about the state funeral, there has been a growing sense of anticipation. And uh, it, it, I'm glad to see it. I, uh, my only regret, I, I think, is that I wasn't there last night uh, to take part in, in the la very large crowds, numbering in the thousands, who paid their respects at Collins Barracks. And I do know that there are a number of people who have travelled down from Dublin uh, for today's funeral in Castle Lions. OK, thanks for that, Gabriel. We, we will talk to you later. But for now, we're going to go over to St Nicholas Church in Castle Lions in Cork and our commentators for the state funeral of Thomas Kent, John Bowman and Mary Kennedy. Agus tha fáilt roimh chuig sé pel San Nicholas i Gáslán i Líhán, Sáid Váilí Vjóg i Nírhar Chorcí. A tnú agus ag olivú do nómant tóchtach sá le fádán lá. Sócrat stáit av ronna ar Thomas Kent, dinna dan chóluúdar, dinna dolig an íbert iérig ar son físe, ar son sírse agus ar son gáchin ar chéad sé. Tán tláun ag tiachtas tiach in san sé pélanis agus an cónra a hogan to mach as a ghost the marav. Ni falor, agus an tlana tiach to stack, na gwil sasav agus mortas kinna a bwintlech an okoid sho. Ak maradur dar, er a gaedol sheas, she sokrid tlina an tokrid sho. Thomas Kent was, of course, central to Irish politics of his day. He was an advanced nationalist. He was active in all those great issues of his adult life. The land issue, the language, the Irish Ireland movement, and he was an enthusiast for the music, dancing and games, and the national question, where, of course, he had a profound influence uh, in all manner of means, including his arrest and being brought, there's a very famous picture of being brought across Formoy Bridge. And one of the witnesses, this was just after uh, the Battle of Bonnard House. And one of the witnesses to that was Liam Lynch, who would die seven years later at the end of the Civil War. And Liam Lynch at that time was a Redmondite, a Hibernian, and a home ruler. And at that moment, he was transformed and became uh, a separatist. Yes, Thomas Kent was a victim of General Sir John Maxwell's desire to tell the country beyond Dublin that Maxwell's writ ran. And he was executed after a court-martial which had many flaws. Well, now the bearer party are coming and taking position. They are going to remove the coffin of Thomas Kent from the hearse. The bearer party is made up of the military police from Collins Barracks, which of course is where the remains of Thomas Kent lay for the past 99 years. They were exhumed in June of this year and DNA testing proved that it was the remains of this patriot. And the family made a point that they did not ask for a state funeral, it was offered and they were happy to accept. So the bearer party, shouldering the coffin now, the military police, and the coffin will be received 
by Bishop William Crean, who's the Bishop of Cloyne since 2013, and also by Father Jerry Coleman, who's the parish priest here in Castle Lyons. You can see the family now following the coffin into the grounds of the Church of St. Nicholas. And the immediate relatives um, of the most, the closest relatives are the daughters of his brother William, Kathleen Kent and Prudence Reardon. And they will be accompanied by their children who would be grandnieces and great-grandnieces and nephews. And that's Prudence, that's the two sisters, closest relatives there coming through. Kathleen Kent and Prudence Reardon. The leader of the Bearer Party is Sergeant Sean Carney. You can see him there in front of the Bearer Party from the 1st Brigade of the Military Police Company at Collins Barracks. Prudence, you can see her linking her son, Michael, and beside her is her sister Kathleen, who's linking Nora, who's the daughter of Prudence. They are the... Nora and Michael would be the grandniece and grandnephew of Thomas Kent, and behind them, the younger generation will be the great-grandnephews and great-grandnieces. Thomas Kent was one of nine children to um, David and Mary Kent. But his father died when the ninth child, just after the ninth child was born, and his mother, Mary Kent, brought up the family. He was the fourth of, of nine. And all the descendants at today's funeral are from the families of Edmund and William. Some who emigrated to America had children and family, but those lines have petered out. And all of the family today are descended from Edmund, who was the older brother of Thomas Kent, deceased. May the God of hope give you fullness of peace. And may the Lord of life be always with you. In the waters of baptism, Thomas died with Christ and rose with him to new life. May he now share with him eternal glory. Bishop William Crean is actually a native of Tralee and he was parish priest in Castle Gregory and Tlahan until 2006. And he has been Bishop of Cloyne since 2013. And beside him there you can see Father Jerry Coleman who's the parish priest here in Castle Lines. The church is very typical. It's, it's very small for today's uh, occasion, um, but it's typical in size and style of churches built at this period. It, the Kent family indeed gave some land for the building of this church. Um, but the church is part of what was called once by American historian Emmett Larkin as the devotional revolution in Ireland, that third part of the third quarter of the 19th century when so many churches of this style were built across Ireland including Castle Lines. And as the coffin makes its way up the centre aisle of the church, people blessing themselves in respect to this patriot who for 99 years has lain in the grounds of Collins Barracks. The remains of Thomas Kent, exhumed from the grounds of Cork Prison. See a glimpse of the Taoiseach there in the Kenny as the coffin is laid in position at the foot of the altar. That photograph on the right is the famous photograph, the most used of Thomas Kent, and was used by Sean O'Sullivan in his portrait of the leaders. 
And the music for the Requiem Mass will be provided by the Cork Prison Officers Choir. They sang at the commemorative Mass for Thomas Kent in Collins Barracks last May. And then they were invited by the family to be part of today's Mass. And they were honoured and delighted. And they actually came back early from their summer break to rehearse. See members of the family there. Nora Reardon, who is the grandniece. Beside her, Kathleen Kent, and then her mother, Prudence, and her brother, Michael Reardon. On the left-hand side in the church, there are the Kents of Carrick Navarre. They're all descended from Edmund. Um, and there are so many of them, grandnieces, great-grandnieces and great-grandnevews, with family names of Kent, uh, Walsh, Bracken, McCarthy, Kennedy, and Joanne. And th the great-grandnieces and grandnevews will be participating in the ceremony today, all brought together by their relationship to Thomas Kent, his niece and Prudence. And the bishop introducing and welcoming the nearest relatives of Thomas Kent, who himself died a single man and without children. The president also is introduced and Hard to say who's welcoming who to Castle Lyons, but greeting the immediate relatives, Michael D. Higgins. Thomas Kent is often referred to as the forgotten volunteer of those executed in 1916. In many ways, he was a victim of General Sir John Maxwell, who needed or he felt desired immediate results to ensure that the Easter Rising, which was followed by a week of courts martial, and among those executed by court martial in Cork was Thomas Kent, brought there from Formoy Station by train into a station which he was not to know would 50 years later in 1966 be named after him. The Taoiseach now meeting the nearest relatives. And actually in the year 2000, Kathleen Kent, another niece, unveiled a plaque in Kent Station and that was commissioned and directed by the railway workers in honour of Thomas Kent. That's Nora Reardon, Kathleen Kent, and Prudence. As I mentioned, Sean O'Sullivan, in his famous charcoal portraits of all the 1916 leaders, used that photograph just on the right there, which will be part of the, the gifts today. And... Thomas Kent, of course, just one of two leaders of the 1916 <laughs> Uh, rising to be executed outside of Dublin, the other being Roger Casement, who was executed in England, Pentonville Prison. And it was Casement's, the return of Casement's remains in 1965, which was a, a similar um, taking from prison ground um, the remains of an executed leader and brought back for a burial. That was the first occasion which is comparable to this. Members of the public in the gallery there, you can see them. There are so many people gathered here today that a marquee has been erected in the church grounds so that people can be a part of the ceremony and watch the proceedings on a big screen. And people have lined the route. I have to say Castle Lyons is looking absolutely resplendent. People have put flowers and tricolours all along the route that the coffin would take. 
Looking there now, Sean Kelly, former president of the GAA and MEP, Leonie Riada, who's a Sinn Féin MEP, Deirdre Clune MEP, and also Mark Daly. And behind him, Lauras O Moroku, Ochthron Coltus Kjoltori Erin. And Jerry Buttermer there as well. Archbishop Charles Brown, who's the papal nuncio, and the American ambassador, Kevin O'Malley, and also Dominic Chilcott, the British ambassador to Ireland. Brian Kahn, who's a member of the Council of State, former Thysha, of course, Micheál Martin, um, and represent, representing um, Kathleen. Gen Jennifer McCann, MLA, a Sinn Féin MLA, and also Gerry Adams, president of Sinn Féin. White next, company's quartermaster sergeant and military historian will give the eulogy. There were 32 members of the prison officers' choir, and they're all present today. Their musical director is Jackie O'Connell, and it's her daughter, Emma, who is playing the violin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, peace be with you. Accord you, dear friends, you're very welcome to this Eucharistic celebration of the life and memory of Thomas Kent. We welcome his nieces, Kathleen and Prudence, as we welcome the extended Kent family, for whom this day of Thomas's burial has been a very long wait. 
Initially, they understood it would be a family funeral. And they greatly appreciate that Thomas is being honoured with a state funeral. And so we extend our welcome to Uchtarana Hirn, Michael D. Higgins, and his wife Sabina, to Antishuk and Kenny, to the mayor of Cork, Chris O'Leary, to the mayor of Cork County, John Paul O'Shea, along with all in political and civil leadership who have joined us today. We welcome Reverend Eileen Kremen, the Church of Ireland Rector of the Fermoy Union of Parishes. <clears throat> Representing the Diplomatic Corps, we welcome His Excellency the Papal Nuncio, Archbishop Charles Brown, as we also welcome the Ambassador of the United States, Kevin F. O'Malley, and the British Ambassador, Dominic Chilcott. I welcome to those who are concelebrating with me today, and those especially joining me in the sanctuary, Father Jerry O'Neill, Chaplain of Collins Barracks, uh, Father Michael Kidney, retired prison chaplain, and Fathers Michael Leamy, parish priest of Ratcormack, and Father Gerard Coleman, parish priest of Castle Lines, and Father Nealis O'Donnell, a native of Castle Lines, all of whom have done so much to facilitate our celebration today. You may be seated for a moment now. As we welcome Jerry White to present this eulogy in honor of Thomas Kent. Cordia. Just over 99 years ago, on the morning of the 9th of May, 1916, Comrade Thomas Kent of the Galtee Battalion of Oglignaheron was taken from his cell in the military detention barracks in Cork and executed by a British Army firing squad. Today, as we gather to remember him and pray for the repose of his soul, it is appropriate that we remind ourselves of who he was and why we are here. Born in Coolagown, County Cork in 1865, Thomas Kent was a man of his times. He was a religious man with a strong belief in social justice, who also believed that Ireland should be both Gaelic and free. These beliefs led him to join the Land League, the Gaelic League, the Gaelic Athletic Association, and the Pioneer Total Abstinence Association. Early in 1914, as the Home Rule crisis gripped Ireland, Thomas and his brothers decided to join the newly formed Nationalist Volunteer Force, Oglig Naheran, or the Irish Volunteers. In the summer of 1915, in the aftermath of the split in the movement over participating in the First World War, Thomas Kent joined Terence McSweeney in reorganising the Cork Brigade. And so successful were their efforts that by April 1916, a total of 47 volunteer companies had been formed in the county. Because of the series of conflicting orders that emanated from volunteer headquarters in the week before Easter, the first Thomas and his brothers, David, Richard and William, heard about the 1916 Rising was when they read about it in the newspapers. In the absence of any clear orders, they armed themselves and decided not to stay in the family home at Bernard at night until the military situation was clarified. On the 1st of May, the Kents learned that the Rising had failed and they decided it was safe to remain at home. Fate, however, would dictate otherwise. Early the following morning, 
Their home was surrounded by members of the Royal Irish Constabulary, who called upon the brothers to surrender. The Kents refused, and a gun battle erupted, which only ended after British Army reinforcements arrived and the Kents ran out of ammunition. During the fight, Head Constable William Rowe was killed and David Kent was injured. After the brothers surrendered, Richard attempted to escape, but was shot and seriously wounded. Once order was restored, David and Richard were taken to Fermoy Military Hospital for treatment. Thomas and William were then marched to Fermoy Military Barracks, and their mother Mary followed in a horse and cart. Thomas made the journey in his stocking feet, and although the image he presented was anything but heroic, it had a profound impact on many of those who witnessed it. Mary Kent was subsequently released after a couple of hours, and the following day, Thomas and William were put on a train and taken to the military detention barracks in Cork. Two days later, Richard died of his wounds, and Thomas and William were brought before a field general court-martial and charged with waging war against His Majesty the King. William was acquitted, but Thomas was found guilty and sentenced to death. In the early hours of the morning of 9th of May, 1916, Thomas Kent received his last meal and spent some time praying with Father Patrick Sexton, the chaplain of Cork Military Hospital. Shortly before 6 a.m., he was offered some alcohol, but he refused. When asked by the officer in charge if he had any last requests, he asked that Father Sexton consecrate his grave and that no Irishman be ordered to shoot him. Then, in what turned out to be his last act, he gave Father Sexton his pioneer badge and asked him to return it untarnished to Father Michael Ahern here in Castle Lyons. Thomas Kent was then taken from his prison cell and placed against the wall of the exercise yard, and there, clasping a rosary bees given to him by Father Sexton, he stood ready to meet his God. As the bell in the clock tower of Victoria Barracks began to strike six, a volley of shots rang out, and Thomas Kent fell to the ground and breathed his last. His remains were then placed in a shallow grave in the exercise yard, where they were destined to lay for 99 years. There was nothing in Thomas Kent's history to indicate he was a violent man. In fact, it was confirmed at his court-martial that he hadn't resisted arrest on a previous occasion. We will never know the last order the Kent brothers received from volunteer headquarters, or what motivated them to resist on that fateful day in May. However, in acting as they did, they were actually following an order to resist arrest that had been issued the previous Wednesday before the Rising by Owen McNeill, the Chief of Staff of the Irish Volunteers. In the weeks and months ahead, what happened in Ireland in Easter 1916 will be carefully examined and debated. In this regard, it will be important to remember that these events must be looked at in the context of their own time. It is also important to remember that the Ireland of today is not the Ireland of 1916. We live in a different country and in a rapidly changing world that presents its own challenges. However, as we face these challenges, we can be and should be inspired by the ideals of patriotism and self-sacrifice that motivated Thomas Kent, his family, and the men and women of 1916. Thomas Kent's death was a huge loss for his family and the Irish volunteers. For 99 years, his remains lay behind the walls of a prison, beneath a headstone that bore the title Oglig Naherin and the emblem of the volunteer movement. It was a lonely grave in a lonely place. For many people, he remained an obscure figure, the forgotten volunteer, someone they knew Kent Station in Cork was named after, but little else. Today, however, all that has changed. 
Thomas Kent has once again become someone who is very much in the present. Today, members of Oglid Naharan, the Irish Defence Forces, will render the military honours that were denied him 99 years ago. Today, he will no longer be the forgotten volunteer. Today, the people of Ireland will remember. Today, after 99 years, Thomas Kent is finally coming home. Ayeshdi go rahanam dilish. And I'm sure Jerry White's address, you may have seen Sean Sherwin. He was working as Kent family liaison with the government departments in the exhumation. Now some emblems will be brought to the altar, symbolising the, the life of Thomas Thank Kent. You, they will be you brought remain seated by his great-grandnephews. Invite Margaret O'Brien to introduce the symbols of Thomas's life and will be joined by Emmett Reardon and Jeff Reardon and David O'Flynn. O'Brien is a grandniece. Mm -hmm. A photograph of Bernard House, the Kent family home, is brought to the altar by Emmett. It was here at Bernard that Thomas shared his days with his mother, sister and brothers. Margaret is actually a school principal in Tulla in County Clare, and she's on the board of Mary Immaculate College as well. And that's the Jeff house. brings Thomas's rosary beads to the altar, a symbol of his deep religious conviction and faith. Jeff also brings, as a symbol of Thomas's lifelong temperance, a pioneer pin which belonged to his recently deceased nephew and namesake, Thomas. The rosary beads were found with his body. They were given to him by Father Patrick Sexton, the chaplain, just before his execution. He held them while he was being executed. Marvaul the Conra na Gaeilge rinne sé sár iarracht an tianga agus an cultúr sin a cur chun cín. Agus tá an thahar pádair curhe sa chlós in san sé He actually ministered to David Kent when he was wounded that during the raid on Bonnard House before they were brought into Formoy. We might stand now. Which was the on Tahar Pather, um, and that our then celebration might be worthy and conscious in memory of Thomas. We take a quiet moment as we begin, as we place our lives consciously in the presence of the Lord of all mercies. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And may Almighty God have mercy on us. May he forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life.
Francis Curie and uh, his youngest pray. daughter Leah is <clears throat> in the congregation. O oh God, Almighty Father, our faith professes that your son died and rose again. Mercifully grant that through this mystery, your servant Thomas, who has fallen asleep in Christ, may rejoice to rise again through him, he who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. You may be seated now for the liturgy of the word. And Anne, Duane, and Nora Reardon will lead us in the liturgy of the word. Grand nieces of Thomas Kent. And Nora Reardon will do the first reading. She's the daughter of Prudence. Thomas Kent's niece. A reading from the book of Ecclesiasticus. Let us praise illustrious men, our ancestors in their successive generations. The Lord has created an abundance of glory and displayed his greatness from earliest times. Some wielded authority as kings and were renowned for their strength. Others were intelligent advisors and uttered prophetic sayings. Others directed the people by their advice, by their understanding of the popular mind, and by the wise words of their teaching. Others composed musical melodies and set down ballads. Others were rich and powerful, living peacefully in their homes. All these were honored by their contemporaries and were the glory of their day. Some of them left a name behind them so that their praises are still sung. But here is a list of illustrious men whose good works have not been forgotten. In their descendants, they find a rich inheritance. Their offspring will last forever. Their glory will not fade. Their bodies have been buried in peace and their name lives on for all generations. The peoples will proclaim their wisdom the assembly will celebrate their praises. The word of the Lord. Reading is Anduan. The star letter Nave Paul Quick McCorantic. Grand niece. Mar ain dinner tie greased, stinna e ta crutter as a nua. Tan shan illeg, feoch of stan nua tagaha. I say dear a hug on tum lawn a Greek. Mar say a hug shinia con a winter slash fain tree creased. 
agus a dog and tab interest in a curum oringa. Is a shin the raw, grave dear e greased, a turt and down con a winterous lesh vein, gone kunt in the dean agar turha, agus garfunia a dog she fogart and a winterous shin. The rare shin is ambassadori her kelm creased shinna. Margotrina ta dia e gakani. You say a impiamidor of an anim creased a winterous a yen of ledia. Marante ud nor of old dawn pecker, Rinadia pecker de er wahalina, down Gunin fidinia for in tucked day on. Brehurantierna. Actually, Anne Duane's son got married yesterday in Rathcormac, which is just a couple of miles up the road. now purify me, your wisdom direct me, your power sustain me, your mercy forgive me, your patience bear with me, your love prepare me, call me and receive me forever. And son, I guess I should quick will on Kyoshin or Usides and Joe. Is as a gown to show that a her, Tommy, far more Gaelach, I guess on the road to Ligoni as a arch gochish. Father Jerry Coleman, parish the Lord priest be with you. of Castellans. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus went up into the hills and summoned those he wanted. So they came to him, and he appointed twelve. They were to be his companions and to be sent out to preach with power to cast out devils. And so he appointed the twelve. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, are sons of thunder, then Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the man who was to betray him. The Gospel of the Lord. It follows now the homily from the Bishop of Cloyne, Dr. William Cream. My friends, today's gathering in faith and prayer in memory of Thomas Kent is a most unusual funeral. It writes the final chapter in a long ordeal for the Kent family, as today serves as a moment of closure as they lay Thomas in his final resting place among his own people 
and alongside his family. This strange and unusual set of circumstances were forged by the tragic events of 99 years ago, when Thomas chose to give his life in the cause of freedom. He and others thereby sowed the seeds of the flowering of a new political dispensation, which would become the Republic of Ireland, of which we are all beneficiaries. No doubt, his dream for a new Ireland and the vigour with which he sought to realise that dream drew deeply from the well of inspiration of the generations who had gone before him. And the book of Ecclesiasticus invited us and invites us let us praise illustrious men and women, our ancestors in their successive generations. In their descendants, they find a rich inheritance. Their offspring will last forever. Their glory will not fade. Their bodies have been buried in peace and their names live on for all generations. The people will proclaim their wisdom. The assembly will celebrate their praises. My friends, when we recall today the patriot martyrs of the Isa Rising and thereafter, a certain tentative mood prevails in our time, uncertain of the worth of violent resistance. I see his blood upon the rose from which a terrible beauty was born. Violence and war are cruel instruments by which to accomplish any human endeavour. Violence and war, as we witness today, wreak havoc and tragedy in the lives of so many, leaving deep scars of sadness and loss, which call out for retribution and revenge. The Lord Jesus, in choosing his apostles, chose one whom history remembers as Simon the Zealot. Those who seek to right injustice and oppression are people of zeal in the very best sense of the word. The zeal of Thomas Kent was evident in every facet of his life. Fi fir groge than goelge. Fi si an of rodul freshen as an irat kiol etoigin. Nuravi ur avosh eg dridim lesh. Fi an padrin in a lovege. Agaseg urni ochri conardine isa Christ, three other gui on Maiden Banaha. Into the hands of the Lord he consciously commended his spirit. The person of zeal is profound in conviction and sure in the cause of right. Thomas Kent was one such man amongst others, women and men, who shared his dream and sought to make it a reality. He and his compatriots dreamed the dream of freedom. They yearned to feel its bracing freshness in which identity, culture, language, and commerce could prosper and flourish. It's a source of immense gratitude to God that we in our time can witness the dawn of peace and engage in the difficult task of reconciliation. St. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, lays the spiritual foundation 
for that work of reconciliation. As we recognize the terrible beauty that is born, St. Paul would say to us, for anyone who is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old order is gone and a new being is there to see. I mean, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not holding anyone's faults against them, but entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. My friends, might I conclude with some verses from the end of the long, the long prose poem entitled Requiem and Invocation by Denise Levertov. Towards the end of the poem, Levertov writes, what do they ask, the martyrs, of those who hear them, who know the story, the cry, who know what brought our land to this grief? What do their debts demand? Their debts enjoin upon us the living, not to give up the vision of lives freed from the lead weight of centuries, clear of the satin of the stain of indigo, stench of fermenting sugar, whistle of whiplash, cramps of hunger, ache of lost dignity, loss of the ancient rhythms, vision of simple peace, sharing our minds, our labor, our soup, teaching hope to our children, putting behind us the terror of centuries. Those who were martyred tell us that horror won't cease on the earth till the hungry are fed, that all of us are our brother and sister's keepers, members of one another, responsible, culpable, and able to change. This is the knowledge that grows in power out of the seeds of their martyrdom. Er yeshte greva anam delish. Amen. Bishop Cloyne, Dr. William Crean, choosing the words there of Denise Levertov uh, to end that homily. American, 20th century poet. She was born in England. Her father was born Jewish and was converted to Christianity and was an Anglican clergyman. And she later went to America and was an American citizen. You saw also there Tomaso Shirkoin of the Tom Kent branch of the so let us stand of now national servicemen. As we pray our prayers of the faithful. And John, Christine, uh, Tom, Miriam, and Reverend Eileen will join us to lead us in these prayers. God, the Almighty Father, raised Christ, his Son, from the dead. With confidence, we ask him to save all his people, living and dead. We pray, we pray for Thomas Kent. Today, after many years, he will be laid to rest with his beloved family. We ask you, Father, for your blessing on all who helped to bring about his final journey to Castellines. Ahirna Aisling. John Walsh, great grand nephew. Christine O'Flynn. We made our son winter count as Bonard, August the Good. Queenie made fresh and iron welta a ta imaha rompu. Gui made grave souvenirs shiri arhu a masna nangal August the Nave, a lawher day. 
a hear na Aisling. Christine O'Flynn, she's the daughter of Nora Reardon and a great grand niece. Tom Walsh, grand nephew. Do you need her son Canarina Tira, cry of Norian Stoy, be a Yasa in a Griha, Agasan Tir Fenagorum, a hear na Aisling. We pray for peace in the troubled parts of our world, peace in our country, peace in our homes, and peace in our hearts. Ahirna Aisling. Reverend Eileen Kremen is Church of Ireland Rector of the Union of Parishes for Moy. Lord, heal the memories of hurt and failure. Give us the wisdom and grace to use aright the time that is left to us on earth, to turn to Christ and follow his steps in the way that leads to everlasting life. God, our shelter and our strength, you listen in love to the cry of your people Hear the prayers we offer you for our departed brothers and sisters. Cleanse them of their sin and grant them the fullness of redemption. And this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's be seated now for the offertory. And Tom and Fiona. <clears throat> Pray, my sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. As we humbly present to you these sacrificial offerings, O Lord, for the salvation of your servant Thomas, we beseech your mercy that he who did not doubt your son to be a loving saviour, may find in him a merciful judge who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts and let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him, the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned that those saddened by the certainty of dying may be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended. When this earthly dwelling turns to dust and an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven, and so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Let us kneel. <clears throat> you are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. <coughs> For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. <clears throat> when we eat this bread and when we drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until.
Therefore, O oh Lord, we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O oh Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and William, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Remember your servant, Thomas, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that he who was united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection. And from the earth he will raise up in the flesh those who have died and transform our lowly body after the pattern of his own glorious body. To our departed brothers and sisters too, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, when you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. For seeing you, our God, as you are, we shall be like you for all the ages, and praise you without end. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him. O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. The other good celebrants are Father Jerry O'Neill, Neilish O'Donnell, and Michael Leamy. Shasami the Nish Quimish Conana her fame of winners, Lon of Horror, doing a yano.
Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the kingdom and the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. And we might share with one another a sign of that peace in Christ. Peace be with you. The congregation, of course, is both inside and outside the church here in Castle Lyons with a screen outside for the congregation there, the better to be participants in the Mass because the church itself is, of course, too small. Brian, Khan, there. Shaking the hand of Deirdre Clune, MEP. Kathleen Kent and Prudence. Reardon, the two closest relatives, and the bishop now. And it was quite by accident, really, that the Cork Prison Officers' Male Voice Choir became involved. They offered to sing at this Mass and were welcomed by the Kent family. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And blessed are those who are called to the Supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy. You should enter under my roof. Only say the word to my soul. May the body and blood of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. Our on all and throw the shunt on the shoe where the water is on the hind to I got no man so exocrit.
a very big history associated with this church. And uh, as is true of so many churches on this scale in Ireland, the Land League was strong in this area. Father Thomas Ferris, parish priest in the 1880s, was, was evicted in 1883. He was the president of the local Land League, as was often the case with priest. And he didn't refuse to pay his rent. He lost his land and he lived in a very small house for the rest of his days. And he's commemorated there in that plaque in the church. And again, Pather O'Leary, Canon O'Leary, Canon Peter O'Leary as parish priest was his name, but the great Irish writer. He is buried in these grounds. And at 6.30 in the morning of May the 2nd, after the Battle of Bonard House, he was sought because the RIC Constable Frank King ignored orders. He was part of the arresting party. He ignored orders when he saw what trouble Richard Kent was in, and he went for a priest. And it was Canon Peter O'Leary, a Thahar Pather, who came, and he saw the house that morning. And it shows the complexity of relations in a small community between police and community. An opportunity also to reflect on the, the role of Thomas Kent's mother, Mary, a powerful matriarch, especially during the singing there of A Word of Water, and also in the early hours of um, May the... She was helping her sons by reloading the rifles as the RIC were outside. And when the, the battle ended and the sons were taken to Formoy, David and Richard to the military hospital and William and Thomas to the military barracks. She followed behind, as we heard earlier, in horse and cart. And she died eight months after her son Thomas was executed. Echoes, I suppose, of Porrick Pierce's poem, Lord, thou art hard on mothers, they suffer in their coming and in their going. And of course, the volunteers, the Kents were involved in the volunteers, Thomas uh, particularly, and David. Uh, David later became an abstentionist Sinn Féin MP. He was elected in the 1918 election. But this area was empowered by the Thomas Kent execution in 1916. And many of those I mentioned, Liam Lynch before, Liam Lynch witnessed uh, Thomas Kent being brought barefoot in his stockings across Formoy Bridge and was utterly changed. His whole politics changed and he became the leader of so much. And the David's life, by the way, may have been saved. He was so injured in the battle that night on May the 2nd that his life may have been saved by Dr. Brody in Formoy Hospital who refused to allow him uh, to be passed fit for court-martial. So he, his court-martial was delayed until a different mood prevailed and Maxwell's anxiety to get quick executions was at last uh, stayed. John Dillon of the Parliamentary Party was enraged by Thomas Kent's execution. And in the House of Commons, in a famous speech, he forced Prime Minister Herbert Asquith that any future courts martial would be held in public with open doors and Asquith acceded to that. Thomas Kent, of course, was buried in quicksand as Roger Casement was in Pentonville Prison, but now to be returned to the Kent family vault in Castle Lands. You can see the importance of the Kent family here from the stature and of the grave. The Kent family, honoured house, cool lore in Castle Lines. David Kent there was a young, he's a son obviously, but David, who would be Thomas's brother, was later court martialed and saved. David Kent there was saved by, as I said, uh, Dr. Brody because he probably would have been uh, 
could have been executed had he been at the same court martial because that court martial was flawed. It had no legal skills among the officers holding it. And even the accusation that he did take part in armed rebellion for the purpose of assisting the enemy was those words were chosen because those words delivered a guilty verdict and execution if guilty. And they were the words for all the Kilmainham executions of the 1916 leaders. And that the purpose of the, the, the use of those words was that it would be execution if guilty. They were totally inappropriate to what had happened at Bonnard House. There was no armed rebellion. The purpose of assisting the enemy, it was refusing arrest and with a death that followed of the RIC constable. Great participation, as you can hear, from those in Castle Lands, and they also are appreci appreciating the wonderful choir singing by the Cork Prison Officers Male Voice Choir that can be appreciated too by the audience. And that tent behind was if it was raining, you can see that it would have been inadequate, but everybody is access to a screen here, and the better to join in the congregation of this Mass. And, of course, the 2nd of May was not the first time that Thomas Kent was arrested in 1890. He fought alongside his brothers for tenants' rights in the Land League, arrested, charged with conspiracy and got two months' hard labour. And then in 1916, in January, as a member of Oaklick na Heron, he was arrested for disrupting peace. He was acquitted then, arrested again a month later for having illegal arms and got two months in prison. And as we know then, on the 2nd of May, was arrested court-martialed and executed on the 9th of May in 1916. Historians write of the Battle of Bonnard House as a result of tragedy rather than calculation. Irish Blessing, arranged by Keith Chuke from the Cork Prison Officers Male Voice Choir.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord God, whose Son left us in the sacrament of his body, food for the journey, mercifully grant that, strengthened by it, our brother Thomas may come to the eternal table of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Thanks to all of you for your prayerful presence, the Kent family today, and all of those who have honored us with your presence and honored his memory by your presence. We pray the final prayer of commendation and farewell. Before we go our separate ways, let us take leave of our brother Thomas. May our farewell express our affection for him. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet him again when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Saints of God, come to his aid. Hasten to meet him, angels of the Lord. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. May Christ who called you take you to himself. May angels lead you to the bosom of Abraham. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother Thomas in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. Merciful Lord, turn toward to us and listen to our prayer. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help all of us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brother forever. This and all our prayer we make through Christ our Lord. Amen. In peace now, let us take our brother to his place of rest. <clears throat> This is Going Home, the music of Dvorak and the words by William Arms Fisher. Oman Socrates.
Party taking the coffin out of the Church of St. Nicholas now to its final resting place in the family vault in the churchyard. Thomas's mother Mary is not buried in this family grave. She is with the right her, she was a rice before marriage and she's with her family there. But she was a remarkable woman. She had nine children, was widowed just after the ninth was born in 1876. One daughter died and she brought up the rest of her children and adopted a farm laborer's son uh, who was never forgot the kindness and later from America helped the Kents to buy out Bonnard House under the Land Acts. So the history of this part of North Cork, which had a very big role in the War of Independence, and the history of the Kent family following those events, those awesome events of May the 2nd. May the 2nd was, the Mon May the 1st was the Monday after the Easter Rising. There were elaborate plans for Cork to join the Rising. That didn't happen. Uh, there were confusion and indecision in Cork and the Bonnard boys who were there, the Kent boys had been there ready to participate, but they came back and this battle at Bonnard House happened. Perhaps it shouldn't really have happened because it, this is within a few miles of Formoy, which was a garrison town and very close to British Army bases. And so it was a hopeless thing to be firing in that time when the RIC came to arrest them. But that's what happened. and courts martial followed and as I said earlier uh, General Sir John Maxwell wanted another execution not in Dublin he wanted the message to go wider that the rising was over and that his writ ran and that really is the reason why Thomas Kent was executed uh, if proportionately there would be a hundred executions or more in Dublin uh, of those court martialed after the rising if the offence that Thomas was accused of. But of course the wording, as I said, that they chose was deliberately chosen to get a result. Uh, take part in armed rebellion for the purpose of assisting the enemy. So, so now as the uh, congregation gathers around the Kent family tomb, you can see Ochthron uh, Heron, President Higgins, and his wife Sabina. And they are about to take the tricolour from the coffin and it will be given to the members of the, the Kent family. The second in command of the bearer party will fold the flag, hand it to Sergeant Sean Carney and he will hand it to the, the family. And there was a glimpse there earlier of a member of the army 
number two band based in Collins Barracks here in Cork and they will perform the, the music for this part of the ceremony at the, the graveside. And the two closest relatives, Prudence Reardon and Kathleen Kent, both uh, nieces, will receive the flag for the family. And there's a song, Sweet Bernard, which was written in memory of Thomas Kent. And the last two lines seem particularly poignant at this moment. They are, may the sod rest light on your noble hearts, the sod you died to save. And may the gentle breeze from out the trees deck fragrance on your grave. Well, this is about to happen 99 years after the execution of Thomas Kent. It was really moving to watch the coffin coming down the aisle and the bearer party with such dignity and respect. That's Corporal Ian McGrath now. First Brigade Military Police Company at Collins Barracks, handing the tricolour to Sergeant Sean Carney. Kathleen accepting it on behalf of the Kent family. Kathleen, a niece of Thomas Kent. And Kathleen Kent, Kathleen Kent's father, William is buried in this in this grave, as is David, who later became a Sinn Féin TD in the first, second, third, and fourth Dáil. Um, he then didn't contest, and William. My brothers and sisters, we believe that all the ties of friendship and affection which knit us as one throughout our lives do not unravel with death. Confident that God always remembers the good that we have done and forgives our sins, we pray, asking God together to gather Thomas to himself. We read from sacred scripture. Come, you whom, who are blessed by my Father, says the Lord. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, who by your own three days in the tomb, you hallowed the graves of all who believe in you, and so made the grave a sign of hope that promises resurrection, even as it claims our mortal bodies. Grant that our brother Thomas may sleep here in peace until you awaken him to glory, for you are the resurrection and the life. Then he will see you face to face, and in your light will see light, and know the splendor of God, for you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Thomas Kent never married, and he was 51 years of age when he was executed. And as he approached the centenary celebrations of 1916, there is one My surviving friends, child in reverence, of a volunteer. We pray to God, the source of all mercies. You raise the dead to life, give to our brother Thomas eternal life. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. For our relatives and friends who have gone before us and await the kingdom, that they may know the reward of their goodness. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. For those who have fallen asleep in the hope of rising again, 
that they may see God face to face. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For those whose faith is known to you alone, that they will have light, happiness, and peace. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For ourselves who have assembled here to worship in faith, that we may be reunited one day with all whom we love. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And we pray for the coming of the kingdom as Jesus has taught us to. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord God, whose days are without end, and whose mercy is beyond counting. Keep us mindful that life is short, the hour of death unknown. Let your spirit guide our days on earth in the ways of holiness and justice, that we may serve you in union with the whole church, sure in faith, strong in hope, perfect in love. And when our earthly journey is ended, Lead us rejoicing into your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord. May he rest in peace. Amen. May his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed, to the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Thomas Kent's body is now placed in the grave. <laughs> Presently there will be a graveside oration by Antishuk and Kenny. There is one surviving child of a volunteer of 1916. He is Father Joseph Mallon. He has spent 60 years in China as a Jesuit missionary, and his father, Michael Mallon, was second in command of the Irish Citizen Army under James Connolly. Prudence Reardon now lays a wreath. And she's accompanied by her son, Michael. David Kent there and William Kent both became TDs, William for Fianna Fáil, and later indeed for the Farmers' Party, and then it merged with the Centre Party and Common Yale, so he had the distinction of uh, being drawn both parties. Clown Kent, Winter Hashlon Elihan, was going to use the Belair. His character was this Cordo Venture New, and Thomas Kent. Gael agus leach vi in a li in uig gananam i brizun chorki le biagna kid plina nuas a chori in uig a chlanda and sha in gashlan i lihon. The Thomas Takiwale Fuyera Huigan clan in a rugway, Gujianach in a togiway. Mar be vien le nachlan le blien ten uas. Kui mis kuleir, kvai she suv na shiri in aoch tuchish agus i mask a winter hain. President, distinguished guests, members of the Kent family, people of Castle Lyons. It was on the 9th of May, 1916, a Tuesday in early summer. At Verdun, French forces would have some success northwest of Piemont Farm. At Salonica, <coughs> for the British, General Millen would succeed General Mahan. And that day too, diplomats Sykes and George Picot were looking to the end 
of the Great War and the Ottoman Empire. Across the Atlantic, in the New York Times, the news of Ireland's sudden revolt slid from the front page. The execution of four more leaders consigned to within. And in an Irish dawn, a man from these parts of Castle Lyons and sometimes Boston was executed by a firing squad. He was the patriot, Thomas Kent. And today, Ireland comes to reflect on his courage, his dignity, his defiance, and his sacrifice. We come here to claim and to acclaim, to thank Thomas Kent. Today, we take him from the political potter's field to lay him with full honors among his own. In Cork last night, history escaped from the pages of the old school books to beat in the hearts of the men and women who queued quietly and thoughtfully in the dying light to pay their first and last respects to Thomas Kent. Young and old, they streamed past his coffin. Their very presence, their tribute to a man, a leader who lived and died for the Ireland and the future that they now inhabit. An Ireland that is free, an Ireland that is open and tolerant, an Ireland where 100 years on, if we carry any papers at all, they are the international credentials of respect and dignity and compassion. Across the world, at sites of famine, it is an Irish voice that comforts. In zones of conflict, it is an Irish hand that keeps peace and gives protection. Today, in the blue and gray of the Mediterranean, it is the green, white, and orange borne by the men and women of our naval services that symbolize human hope and heart and dignity, that signify rescue, even redemption, for our humanity itself. And it is that same humanity, dignity, and hope that kept and moved Thomas Kent. In this state funeral, we honor Thomas Kent as one of 16 patriots executed in the aftermath of the Easter Rising of 1916, one of only two outside of Dublin, Roger Casement in London and Thomas Kent in Cork. Now we bear his remains home here to Castle Lyons, as has long been the desire of his family and his relatives. He was a single man, but he is a large, loving, and extended family with us today. And I want, on behalf of you all, to pay tribute to his closest relatives, his nieces, Prudent Reardon, Kathleen Kent, and Eileen Kent. These three women have tended the flame of his memory. They make sure that Thomas Kent's time extends to our own time and that of our children. In his fine eulogy earlier, Company Quart Quartermaster Sergeant Jerry White described Thomas Kent's life and the circumstances of his death. Indeed, Thomas Kent was born in 1865, not far from this spot. The fourth in a family of nine, born to David Kent and his wife, Mary Rice, with six brothers and two sisters. 
as a young man. Thomas lived for a time in Boston. Returning from America, he became involved in land league agitation through the Gaelic League and the Gaelic Athletic Association. Thomas devoted himself later to Irish culture and sport. He also became, as we know, a proud pioneer, abstaining from alcohol throughout his life. The foundation of the Irish Volunteers saw Thomas Kent and his brothers resume their political activity. By 1914, they had joined the Cork Brigade. By April 1916, Thomas was Commandant of the Galtee Battalion. As is now well known, confusion reigned in the days preceding the Rising. And consequently, it was confined largely to Dublin. But in its immediate aftermath, all across this county, in Dunmanway, in Mill Street, in McCroom, in Bandon, in the then Queenstown, Mitchellstown, Clonakilty, and in Cork City itself, houses were raided and suspects detained. Neither Castle Lyons nor the Kents would escape attention. And so in the early hours of Tuesday, the 2nd of May, a party of RIC men surrounded the family home at Bornard. Mrs. Kent, then in her 80s, was in the house along with her sons, Thomas, David, Richard, and William. The family, as we know, resisted arrest. A gun battle followed right to the end of their ammunition, with Thomas reportedly having had no time to don his boots still in his stocking feet. David Kent was wounded. Head Constable William Rowe of the Royal Irish Constabulary was killed. And the brothers surrendered. Richard Kent, an athlete, made to escape. He was shot and, as we know, died a few days later. For their part, William and Thomas faced court martial. William acquitted, Thomas convicted and sentenced to death. The rest is quite literally history, but also a matter of national memory. Because in the time ahead, in Glasnevin, William Rowe and Richard and Thomas Kent will be commemorated together with all others who lost their lives in 1916 as we reflect on the centenary year. But today, after 99 years, we bring Thomas Kent home home to Castle Lyons, home to his people who love him, who remember him, and who grieve for him and the life that he lost. And we do so in accordance with the wishes of the Kent family. Today, in our time, we are not called upon to die for our country. But even now, even with our freedom, in our own and in a very different time, we need men and women who believe. We need men and women who believe in community, who believe in country, in putting others before themselves. This includes the members of our Defence Forces, Oglin Heron, who continue their time-honoured tradition of service of their country, both at home and abroad. And it is fitting that it is they who have brought Thomas here on his final journey. Let us therefore think of Thomas Kent, not only as a patriot, 
a nationalist, commandant, volunteer, but also as a neighbor, a friend, a brother, an uncle, a son. We think of him as a 50-year-old, ordinary, an extraordinary man from Castle Lyons, whom we still hope, still heard birdsong on those early summer nights and in the foxlight of his final morning. <coughs> the politics, the virtue, the sacrifice of Thomas Kent can never be abstracted from their human context. He and all who gave their lives stirred something deep and essential in those who had been previously hostile or indifferent. Whether they were in a cottage or a tenement or a field or at Yeats's counter or desk or in grey 18th century houses. Instinctively, they sensed the futility of these polite, meaningless words that all was changed, changed utterly. So, from the trees here at Castle Lyons and all along the Lee and the Blackwater, Thomas Kent has long been sung to eternal sleep. Now may he rest in peace among his own. The most count, Goel agus leach, leach agus goel, suvnas shiri gach, gachara ame, er yeshte grawa anam dilish. And applause from the audience, from the congregation for Antishuk. And Kenny. He mentioned there the RIC constable killed in the battle. Well, Bonard. Well, uh, to... well, oh, break. Uh. Next, the firing of the volley of well. shots. No, no. Post and son, Healy and Gwildolgas and Taidora Colin. Oh, Brig! Arm! Um. 
the Taoiseach. They're emphasising how inclusive next year's 1916 celebrations will be because he mentioned that they will include William Rowe, who was the RIC constable killed in the Battle of Bonnard. And also referring to Thomas Kent as a local man, a family man, and Michael Reardon during the week spoke about that when he said no family would want a family member not to be given a respectful burial. And certainly that's what's happening here this afternoon, a respectful burial for Thomas Kent. The National Flag Officer there is raising the tricolour. He's Captain Stephen Malumphy from Ballyduff in County Waterford. And he was captain of the Waterford hurling team for three years. Mel! Tarragui! Arm! Mark Mellett, Deputy Chief of Staff, and guard the Commissioner, Nora O'Sullivan. Army Band 1 Brigade, conducted by Captain Brian Prendergast, concluding this ceremony. And Thomas Kent, often referred to as the forgotten volunteer of those executed in 1916, is no longer forgotten. Remembered here this morning and now interred in the family vault at Castle Lyons after a state funeral, some 99 years after his execution. His importance lies in the martyrdom which followed that execution on how it helped transform nationalist opinion and expectations. Home rule no longer enough, full independence needed. And Thomas Kent embraced the Irish Ireland movement of the 1890s, the language, games, music, and if asked himself about his political life, he might have answered as his brother William did when he defined himself as one of the Kent brothers of Bonnard, local land league fighters against tyrannical landlordism. So Thomas de Tatrig Dara on Nomant and so a gosh on Elihan, a Ferrant Eridlan, Law Moore, the Clan Thomas Kent, then Holuder Magord, Agus the Winter Naher and Illa, Martami de Tortomos, the Hirgra Hor, a Yen on Ebert Yerig, a Hoga Hail, or Son of Sirshe, Nihe on Toglock Jaruta, a Hilla A, a Yeshte Gerevshe, a Hashlan Elihan Slanagiv, Agus a Rash Hut, David. Thank you, Mary, and uh, thank you, John, in Castle Lyons. I'm still joined here in studio by Gabriel Doherty of the Department of History and UCC. Gabriel, uh, a very dignified, a very solemn occasion, and obviously entirely in line with the wishes of the Kent family. Absolutely, but, but also intimate. I suppose the, the small scale of the church and the fact that the, the burial took place just a few yards away from, from the church door added to that, that personal quality. And just to go back onto the history of things, because we've heard a lot about uh, Thomas Kent in, in the course of, uh, of the funeral. Um, Bishop uh, Cream said that uh, the zeal of Thomas Kent showed through in everything that he did in his yes. life. And you were mentioning that earlier, the nationalist movements, the pioneer. Yes. He, 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 uh, one of the interesting things, chatting to people this week about Cork in terms of people thinking about what it was about him that, that made him so interesting. He's, he's, he's a familiar type of character that... In everyday life nowadays, we know the person who makes things happen, who is willing to volunteer to do the heavy lifting in an organisation, who will not look for personal glory 
but will put themselves out there and, and will shoulder the burden. So I think that's what the, one of the interesting features about him. He's, this, he's simultaneously extraordinary in terms of the sheer range of things that he does and the, the, the intensity of the commitment that he shows. But he's also recognisable that there are, that there's, you find Thomas Kent's in many walks of life. A life through, through to the present day. Sure. Um, just in terms of what actually happened at the time, I mean, there's a couple of things that, um, to the to the lay person like myself, seem a bit unclear. One is why why the Kents resisted when they did, and the other is why Thomas, at the court martial, is convicted, and his brother William, who was also inside the house, is set free. In terms of why they resisted, uh, as Jerry White says in his speech, we, we cannot know for certain, but he very correctly brought to. Uh, attention the fact that Owen McNeil, who of course was subsequently vilified in many uh, areas for his countermand order at the time uh, when he became aware of the plans of the Rising, he earlier that week had issued an order to all volunteers that they should resist arrest. And of course, as Chief of Staff, that, that order stood until it was countermanded. So in that sense, they were following orders. Mm. In terms of the reason why William uh, was acquitted, and Thomas wasn't. Well, if one has a look at the transcripts of the trial, there is no obvious reason. Uh, we do know that as far as the police were concerned, William would not have been as big a troublemaker in their eyes uh, as Tom would have been. Uh, but there's no particular reason on the basis of the evidence in front of the court, in front of the, the, the officers who were conducting the court, uh, as, as to why one should have died and the other got off scot-free. OK, well, there's a lot um, of detail there and a lot more to talk about. Unfortunately, we don't have time. But Gabriel Doherty of UCC, thank you very thank much you. indeed for joining us. And that concludes our coverage of the state funeral of Thomas Kent. Thanks to my guest, Gabriel Doherty. From everyone here in Dublin and our broadcast team in Cork, thanks for watching this afternoon. And we leave you with some of the main images from today's ceremony. Good afternoon. <laughs>